The happiness of the new year quickly evaporated with a series of January crises. Jesse Lasky received telegrams from Paris that Cecil was gravely ill with rheumatic fever. He was confined to his bed, unable to move, and the specialists had only guarded optimism for his survival. Massachusetts voted to install a state censor board, and anti-Hollywood sentiment led 37 states to introduce similar bills. The goal was obvious, a nationalized film industry like that of a fascist country. The second Arbuckle trial opened on January 11th. Roscoe's wife Minta was with him, and his defense was so confident of victory that he was not called as a witness. This jury might not be so sympathetic. Paramount still had popular stars and fine directors. William Desmond Taylor was one of the finest. Mary Miles Minter was idolized for her sweetness and beauty. Her fans were unaware that she had an obsessive crush on this indifferent older man. No one knew that he was living a double life, using an assumed name, supporting a wife and child he had deserted, and indulging in relations that could have pushed him out of Hollywood and into jail. His only true friend was Mabel Normand, who was herself recovering from cocaine addiction. The Arbuckle retrial ended with a deadlocked jury, but this time it was 9-3 to three in favor of conviction. The Arbuckle news was eclipsed by a news scandal. Cecil was still in Paris, recovering but unable to move. He could offer no advice about the latest crisis. Mabel Norman had barely read the news when she was brought to the police station for questioning. Because she had visited Taylor the previous evening around 7.30, she was probably the last person to see him alive. Taylor lived in the Westlake District on Alvarado Street in a bungalow court. The detectives reconstructed the previous night's events. Mabel Norman had visited Taylor briefly to pick up some books. He walked her to her car and then returned to his apartment. Neighbors heard a shot, but couldn't tell where it came from. This was a mystery made to order for a scandal-hungry public, and the newspapers served it up. Politicians, preachers, reformers screamed that Hollywood was responsible for the social ills of America. Looking down from his office at the examiner, William Randolph Hearst led the chorus. Hearst films were released through Paramount, but Zucker couldn't challenge Hearst. No one could. The studios needed the press. Cecil was carried on a stretcher onto the SS Patria, bound for home. When Constance greeted him, he was unable to walk. He wanted to start a new film, but he would have to regain his strength. If political cartoons were any indication, Will Hayes was badly needed. In fact, he had accepted Hollywood's invitation in early January. The studios were defending themselves and appealing to the goodwill of the public, but a dramatic entrance would help. And so, the motion picture producers and distributors of America made its debut. A few days later, on March 13th, the third Arbuckle trial opened. The defense made a month-long pitch to a new jury. In an unusual gesture, the jury issued a formal statement.
Roscoe Arbuckle was assured of a comeback. Zucker already had a thousand exhibitor contracts for this film. It was playing to packed houses in big cities. Then, reformers and club women, fueled by hatred of the country's new freedoms, began demonstrating. They attacked every theater playing an Arbuckle film. No one bothered to tell Arbuckle the bad news. It was true that ugly demonstrations had marred the comeback. But it was also true that Zucker sacrificed Arbuckle to appease both Wall Street and Washington. The antitrust accusation was quietly withdrawn. Reformers were hounding senators like Henry Myers into denouncing Hollywood. Risking libel suits, the senator named actors, knowing there was gossip on Vine Street, too. Leatrice Joy had married John Gilbert before his divorce was final. Wallace Reed was supposedly hooked on drugs. William Randolph Hearst was involved with his star, Marion Davies. Jesse Lasky was involved with actress Agnes Ayres. Even Cecil was grist for the rumor mill. Who was Julia Fay? What about his adoring assistant, Gladys Rawson? And what of Jeannie McPherson, who hung on his every word? In April, these rumors were immaterial. Cecil was confined to his home, hoping that years of fitness would pull him through. Until he recovered, there would be no jaunts on his yacht with banking associates. No parties with Jesse Lasky or Will Hayes at Paradise Ranch in the isolated Tohunga Canyon. Hanging over Hollywood was the Massachusetts censor vote. Yet studios like William Fox continued to release controversial films, and reformers planned a new culture. In May 1922, Cecil was well enough to shoot the first footage of a new film. Manslaughter would be a grand morality tale, pointing a finger not only at a speed-crazy socialite, but also at those who were pointing fingers at her, including her district attorney fiancé. Jeannie McPherson had adapted the novel with less guidance from Cecil than usual, since he was still recovering. Jesse got Zucker to give Cecil a larger budget. After 11 years of friendship, Cecil could count on Jesse. Lydia drinks too much and drives too fast, but Dan can't reason with her. Lydia plays tag with a policeman. Nothing slows her down until she causes a fatal collision. Dan refuses to let her off easily. Lydia begins to serve her sentence. The inmate helping Lydia is her former maid, whom she arrogantly and carelessly sent to prison for theft. Having learned humility, Lydia is released, but she is shocked to see that Dan's guilt has made him a derelict. This was the basic plot of the novel, but Cecil felt that it needed some element of what he had seen in Europe and he dictated a vision to Jeannie, a flashback to Rome with Leatrice as an empress. When the barbarians arrive, the Romans are in a drunken stupor and the Empress has sacrificed a civilization to vice. The film was being released while the Massachusetts referendum vote was still pending. Would this film be seen as a lesson or as a taunt? The film opened in late September at New York's immense Rivoli Theater.
film was a solid hit. In late October, Paramount faced yet another scandal. This one had its roots in an incident three years earlier. pain medication was heavily administered morphine. While filming Anatole, Gloria Swanson had felt uncomfortable around Wallace Reed, but she didn't know why. She just felt that there was something odd going on. Variety made a veiled reference to Wallace Reed in 1921. Will Hayes worried that this could affect the Massachusetts censorship vote. Radio had been looked on as a threat, but Hayes saw it as a weapon. It looked as if Hollywood could rest easy about government interference. Then, on December 16th, there was another full-blown scandal. Everyone tried to put on a brave face, but on January 18, 1923, there was no denying the sad truth. It was especially sad for Cecil. He had made Wallace Reed a star. In the fall of 1922, when there occurred two extraordinary archaeological discoveries, the world went mad for Egypt and for dinosaurs. With his usual prescience, Cecil had already been shooting a dinosaur. His next film would look farther into the past than he had ever looked. <laughs> 